Hey folks, if you're enjoying the podcast, please be sure to check out our best-selling book. We took all of our stories and learnings, the good, the bad, and especially the ugly, and packed it into one easy read. Find Love as a Business Strategy, the book, on Amazon or at your favorite book retailer. Visit loveasabusinessstrategy.com for more info. Hello and welcome to Love as a Business Strategy, a podcast that brings humanity to the workplace. We're here to talk about business, but we want to tackle topics that most business leaders shy away from. We believe that humanity and love should be at the center of every successful business. I'm your host, Jeff Ma, and I'm a director at Softway, a business to employee solutions company that creates products and offers services that help build resilience and high performance company cultures. I am joined by co-hosts today, familiar faces, Mohammed Anwar, President and CEO of Softway. Hey, Mohammed. Hey, everyone. And Chris Petrie, Vice President at Softway. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hey. So as you all know, each episode we dive into another element of business or strategy and meet new and interesting people and test our theory of love against the world. And today's guest is Dr. Andrew Kim. He is an, the author of the upcoming book, Culture for the Left-Brained Leader. And so the title alone was enough to get you on this show. Welcome to the show, Andrew. How are you today? Uh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a book that's, that's entitled Culture for the Left-Brained Leader, which chronicles my own journey as an entrepreneur and also helping other companies achieve a similar transformation and um, notice a lot of patterns and notice a lot of uh, a lot of uh, unique obstacles that left brain leaders face that might not be entirely the same. So I'm looking forward to having that released. And I, I know that you all just released a book you all yourself so mm -hmm. congratulations on that i know how okay. how challenging of a journey that can be yeah yeah <laughs> thank but you yeah. this yeah. is going to end up being almost like a book club book club book club episode here um, <laughs> so I, I i'm really excited to dive into that uh, but before we do that um we 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 have to do some icebreakers it's just tradition it's yeah. mandatory and um i'm going to start with Muhammad, we're gonna actually all have the same question today. Um, so Muhammad, you're gonna kick us off. It's sure. actually a very simple, simple question. What is the wallpaper and or lock screen on your cell phone right now? Can I look at it? Absolutely. Well, I, I yeah. forgot. It's okay. So it's the it's a it's a world globe picture. In the space, oh the gosh. default iPhones. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's, what, that's what the, comes out of the box with that image, bro. <laughs> yes, that's you're, what it is. <laughs> you're famous for your selfies, and you haven't applied a single one to your to your lock screen or wallpaper. I okay. I get confused looking at myself, thinking I'm taking a selfie. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, what is your current wallpaper or lock screen on your phone? So I just think what Muhammad did is embarrassing. So I actually worked with Apple to develop a custom um, screen. And I think we made it free for everybody else to use and it came default for everybody else. But we worked together to create um, sort of that starry night sort of color, uh, you know, explosion coming in. So that's what I'm excited about. So thank so you, also, Apple. It was great. Yeah, it was great. So also a default <laughs> Apple lock screen But it was custom for me. It's default for everybody, for everybody else. <laughs> All right, no pressure, Andrew, but <laughs> what is your wallpaper or lock screen on your cell phone? It is a picture of my uh, my boy. He's two and a half years old. I suppose I started doing that shortly after he was born and just rotated maybe about half a year. I think the last the recent one was when uh, when we went to the beach one time and um, and so I think that's the current one. Yeah, yeah. What's what's your son's name? Arthur. 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 Nice. Mm -hmm. That's my dad's yeah. name. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. That is, and that is the correct answer. Congratulations. You you won the ice. Huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what All is right. yours? Mine <laughs> wait, wait, is what's 
Mine is me, me and my daughter. So me and my daughter right now. This is this is when before she could talk back to me, and she's just much nicer to me. So, so I, I I retain that memory on my phone, never letting go. Not to mention. Nice. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into this open panel. Obviously, we're gonna grill you if we can, all of us. But we're just interested in knowing. Tell us, you know, just kick us off. What made you kind of just walk us through? What made you decide to write a book about culture? What's where is you where are you coming from? Give us the background. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, um, I'm a periodontist by training, and also um, I also have an MBA. And so when I embarked upon my journey as an entrepreneur, I had some preconceived notions about it. I thought it was about systems. I thought it was about data tracking and quality assurance. So when I embarked upon my journey as, a, as an entrepreneur, I studied what the best processes are regarding my industry. And not only did I do that, I actually looked at the other industries as well, too. So I can amalgamate the best. <laughs> now... Along my journey of business, I came to realize that's not how business works. There are people attached to the delegates. And mm -hmm. so what I quickly realized is as you're trying to quality assure various, various things, it just doesn't work that way. It's not as simple as, uh, as calling things out based upon your metrics and whatnot, that you actually have to look at the human component of it. And it took, a, it took a very unique journey for me to actually reconcile that in my head because as a, you know, the book is titled um, Culture for the Left Brain Leader. So I myself am a left brain uh, individual who makes sense of things by logic. It took a quite a, a journey to logically reconcile both from a business reasoning standpoint and people's incentives to really come to really understand what's going on. And that's when I actually re finally realized it's actually in the topic of culture. That was a unique journey, a very, very, uh, very, um, it took a lot of paradigm shifts to actually recognize that. And not only that, al along it, you know, I had my own cuts and bruises. So I really wanted to share that journey. I've also helped other companies um, uh, reach a similar type of uh, transformation. And they also had similar types of uh, paradigm shifts that were extremely challenging themselves too. And so I put together a lot of my realizations. I noticed patterns and trends and I consolidated my thoughts in that book just to just so that for those who actually see the world from the logical left brain perspective, for them to have a chance to understand it, because so oftentimes it's the left brainers that are sometimes the bigger resistors to, to this topic. I, I know that because I was a resistor until I understood what it was about. So that's when I realized, you know what, I want to share this journey. I think it might help some people. Uh, yeah. Whether 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 they're trying to achieve that transformation or maybe they're trying to reconcile in the in their heads how it comes together, just just so that just so that they can uh, achieve that transformation and sometimes achieve buy-in a bit more. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's interesting. I'm I'm really curious. Like I've I've worked and went to school with and sort of played with even um, a lot of logic leading um, individuals. And I'm curious to know what was that sort of defining moment that sort of made it, made things click, or was it a situation? Was it a story? Was it an encounter? Like when did it like hit you hard that like oh culture is eating me up and I need to do something different? I think that's a great question. And you know what? It wasn't actually the initial logic that where it got me to see it. I will, when I tried to. Uh, run the business completely through systems and there were be gaps because uh, people would be very skilled and maneuvering around systems that's what i came to realize quite quickly and so as a logical left brainer what the way they would try to get around that is introduce more systems to capture that <laughs> <laughs> i quickly realized that did, that wouldn't work Along the way, I received uh, business coaching myself too, and then they encouraged me to uh, approach it from different angles, like leadership and whatnot. That being said, I I was one of the resistors of it, but my mind started opening once, once, once I hit a brick wall. Once everything that I tried, it wasn't working. And I think sometimes when you when you meet your low point in life, that's when your mind becomes greatest when you're most open to change, when you're most open to opposing ideas, 
that you normally would not be. And so because of that, that's when my mind started saying, hey, you know what, nothing else I'm trying is, uh, is working. Let's give some of these other things a try. Now, it wasn't an easy journey. I, a lot along the way, it felt uncomfortable. I made my people feel uncomfortable. I've led other people to, to um, other companies through those uncomfortable moments themselves too. Mm -hmm. And so basically it's really that, uh, it's really that low point when you start real uh, reevaluating everything that you've been doing. Cause without that, you, you think that you can actually prop it up simply with logic alone. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think there might be some ways to help uh, some logic driven leaders to see it a little bit more logically reconcile it a little bit. They might not buy in right away because again, they're trying to make sense of the world, but when they hit that brick wall, they might go, you know what? Remember that one thing? Let's give this a try. I think it's time. Got it. So I'm curious um, as someone who's not necessarily always logic leading, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that you put together steps to help logic leaders or logic leading leaders sort of get through that process. Um, and I could be a, that could be a, a complete assumption. Again, listeners, I had, I was not a part of any prep, so I'm <laughs> asking questions that you might ask too, but I would assume that, you know, in order to help logic leading folks, you have to lead with logic yourself to convince them to do different or try different, but maybe that's not true. Um, but I'm curious to know, like, is that true? But also what exactly were those steps if steps were taken? Or was it just a chaotic like cacophony of things that you just like <laughs> put a spaghetti at the wall and you abandoned process and just <laughs> dove right in? I'm just curious. <laughs> sure, sure. I'd be happy to I'd be happy to answer that. Well, I, yeah. well, I watched a couple of y'all's um, other episodes. I know that you all understand the complexities associated with culture and how multifactorial it is. So yeah. what it does, what the bug does, and uh, is trying to hit it from all those various angles. So there are a lot of components where we try, we try to understand the business reasoning, just the philosophies behind it. But we also do talk about the various phases. I've noticed that there's a pattern to which these companies have to go through that process. And then one thing I've come to realize is sometimes it's all over. It's in different, different. Um, they do it all, all out of order or all, uh, all uh, out of place. And then there is a, actually an element about the various, um, um, various leadership and management skills as well too, because some and one major component about culture is that it all begins with leadership, right? But to a left brain leader, you know what they think? What the heck does that mean? So <laughs> just soft skills, right? No. I'm not a big fan of the word self skills simply because there's a tendency to downplay the impact of it. So there are, there is a component on the various skills and based upon various scenarios, what are, the, what are various recommendations and another component of just how to interlink culture with strategy. So I know that's, that's, it's a multifaceted question. I tried, I, I wanted to, I wanted um, a book that truly looks at the topic of culture, not from a, uh, not from a patronizing standpoint, but truly a, an encompassing, uh, an encompassing um, uh, discussion uh, that does the topic justice. Got it. Got it. So I had a question. Yeah. Andy. <clears throat> So you mentioned that, you know, until a leader hits this brick wall, it kind yeah. of becomes hard to go through the the change or open up the mind. Is there a way to accelerate that process, get mm -hmm. them to hit the brick wall faster so we can get leaders to start understanding this uh, culture aspect? Or have you witnessed or seen anything like that? Well, uh, I think that's a, um, I think that's a uh, very great and uh, great question. Um, there's five things that I've noticed uh, where people's minds become more open to things. Mm -hmm. The first one is emulation. So basically when they see another leader that they respect do something, then rather than um, rec trying to reconcile that logically in their heads, they actually see it work and go, hey, you know what? There's something that might be there. OK, the uh, second one is speaking, speaking truly to what's what's in uh, what's in their hearts or souls or what's in their minds. OK, speaking their language rather than 
speaking a language that that you're accustomed to yourself by understanding the audience and really resonating with them that's a second component a third one is the low point so when people hit that low point that their minds become very open to change and then basically within a company when when a leader has someone hit that low point I believe that's an opportunity point to actually capitalize on and provide some coaching right there because that's when the mind be mind becomes more open to change than any other time because there I'm sure there are times where a leader wants to talk up want to tra wants to transfer a certain know-how but sometimes feels like it's talking to a brick wall. Mm -hmm. Another one yeah. is actually um a third party. A third party uh uh I don't know if this story um, might resonate, but some folks, let's say they're trying to teach their boy how to play baseball and then try to teach a few different techniques and nothing seems to soak in. But then one day they try to bring in a third party person, maybe a coach, and they say, hey, you know, hey, buddy, you know, just just do a couple of these things. And then the boy tries it and smacks the ball out of the park. And then the boy says, hey, now you're amazing. You're a genius. I wish my daddy tried to show me that. And you're thinking, <laughs> that's what I've been trying to show you the whole time. <laughs> it's my wife. Yep. yep. It's my, it's my yep. wife every day. So sometimes <laughs> a third party perspective, right? Uh, in a strategic manner. And the fifth one, you know what? I think I'm going to have to uh, marinate on what that fifth one was. There were, there were five that that um, that people's minds become open. The, the, those are the four that come on top of my head. Uh, I'll Got let it. you know later in the episode if I come if I remember on top of my head. Sure. No, this this helps. Um, so, <clears throat> talking about low point, can you just describe a little bit like low point in the sense of their confidence or low point in business sense? Like, wh what is that low point described as in terms of a leader? perspective oh i think it, it manifests in um all different shapes and forms for various people i think everyone we all have high hopes and dreams and ambitions and whatnot but then sometimes reality comes and uh, hits you and mm. that's when you start actually um reprioritizing your um what's important to you in life what I came to realize was family was important to me. Once once things started hitting home, that's when I said, you know what? No, I need to start looking into a different different um, uh, perspective. It could be something different for various um, people, but for me, it was it was uh, it was family that started getting me to uh, relook at my priorities. Nice. And once once those once once those priorities starts uh, uh, hitting you, that's when um that's when you feel it you, you feel that this is not the journey of life that i've been wanting to go uh, i didn't mean to start sacrificing um start sacrificing that them and uh and things hitting home and I, I think once and sometimes you don't see it you don't realize something's important to you once you start uh once you start losing it mm. and then it makes you take a step back and go you know what i there is a different, I need to look at different approaches. Got it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. It could be different for different people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. For, for a quick level setting, can you give your definition of how you view a left brain leader versus say a right brain leader? Sure. To me, a left brain leader really um, processes the world through logic. Um, more so than anything else. So it, it really is a combination of seeing the whole world world as cause and effects. Uh, just just a whole plethora of, of uh, combinations of cause and effects. Uh, because of that, and because of the fact that culture and management and leadership has so, it's infinitely complex to the point it's very difficult to logically reconcile that without guidance. <laughs> so to me, a right brain leader um, oftentimes gets to feel out the situation a bit more. It's more in tune with the emotions of, of the various individuals. And a left brain leader um, thinks a bit more systematically, maybe like an engineer, right? To me, that's how that's what uh, defines a, a left brain um, individual for me. Got it. 
Got it. And, and oftentimes left um, to throw another like uh, you know, two cents in that topic. Oftentimes left brain leaders um, struggle a bit in the in management and leadership simply because um, they're trying to make sense of this infinitely complex situation, and and because of that uh, uh, they get burnt out by it. And not only that, uh, sometimes get a little bit impatient and frustrated. That's that's really interesting. I I was you know as you were talking, I was thinking like, man, I've worked and reported into some sort of logic leading and left brain centric you know folks. If you could talk to you know employees who are like me through this podcast right now and say like, here's what you can do to help and support your left brain leader who could be either still on the end where he's not yet aware of sort of all of these complexities and how to navigate them, or they're going through that process, um, what would you advise them to do? How can they be a support? How can they even be sort of the revelation that comes forward to that, um, that left brain leader? Yes. Um, I think uh, one word captures it um, the best, the w- synergy. So meaning that um, if uh, striking a partnership with, uh, with, with that individual, because a left brain leader has, is bringing certain talents into the table and holding the fort in their own way. However, sometimes, um, sometimes uh, they may struggle in seeing um, their own blind spots. So basically by um, creating that partnership with them, uh, that's when you can actually uh, um, uh, create awareness around these blind spots. As as uh, those blind spots become, uh, there's greater awareness around them. There's greater respect for it. And as there's greater respect for it, then their openness might become. Uh, they might become more open to it because the, now they see the cause and effect. They see the cause. Hey, uh, if we if we are if we uh, are skillful uh, in addressing these components of the um, as, uh, of the people side of the business, we tend to get better results. As a respect level of it goes um, goes up, then uh, then they become more open to it. And not only that's also some of the earlier things that we talked about. When do people become open to various uh, concepts? It's also um, it's also that the greatest form of emulation, the best person to emulate is when like the senior leaders are exhibiting it because then they're setting an example that other people want to emulate. Yep. So that's, that's really helpful. Sorry, I dropped something. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But no, I think from from that angle, I could see the employees who are wanting their leaders to get it, who are wanting to be in an environment where they they feel heard, but also they feel like their leader's vision and outcomes and goals are being achieved. This could be extremely insightful for them because I know for personally speaking, when you're not left brain oriented or when you're not leading with logic and you're sort of looking at empathy, you're looking at context, you're looking at all of these things before you think about what to do. Um, having someone that just boils it down to data sets and you know process and systems can be extremely frustrating, if not infuriating. Mm-hmm. Um, and usually you start to see those ideological differences emerge inside of teams and organizations. Um, and to me, as we're talking about this, it feels a lot like we're getting into the aspect of neurodiversity, mm-hmm. where within organizations, as well as when you think about um, individuals who who might have sort of um, social um, situations where they are not comfortable, et cetera, they, they might dominate on that logic end. And as we start thinking about how do we sort of embrace all the differences that are within a society, um, this topic and this book could be a huge insight into supporting all types of individuals, whether they are at the leader, leadership level or you know um, new employees or even interns. So um, not sure if you have any thoughts on that, but that's just, you know as you're talking, that's what I'm thinking about. Yes. Too. Yes. And also, what also helps is for them to see the big picture of how it all connects, seeing the whole architecture of of a, a company that uh, that thrives on its culture, where it, where culture is actually a business strategy, seeing the architecture, meaning that the various communication structures, how the cross functional um, processes within the organization uh, is 
uh, is uh, uh, modified or tweaked in order to enable various things. See the various areas where there's red tape that's actually disrupting it or actually tightening up on certain areas, understanding the chronology of it, the different phases, how it all comes together. When they re logically reconcile that, oftentimes they don't become the resistors anymore. They become the supporters and uh, and the ones who are who are trying to push it forward. But it does take a um, some degree of just logically reconciling how all this comes together. Because the moment when they see it, when they go, okay, I see how this all comes together then oftentimes our resistance goes away but because of their left brain nature they're very talented in um shift uh, in identifying the risks of it okay so we can't do it all at once we gotta go we gotta go a bit incrementally because if we try to do that certain things too soon it exposes too much risk for the organization so then it becomes then it becomes a partnered effort in order to create the the direction or transformation that they uh, wish to achieve while doing it safely. Yeah, uh, sounds very familiar. We had a situation where we had like in our India office, we had a developer who, you know, he was on the hiring panel, right? So he, you know, was one of the folks that was used to sort of vet talent before we ex extended an offer. And we did this little offsite and we asked everyone like, how important is sort of uh, culture adding and sort of the culture element um, over or in comparison to just pure skills and abilities and capabilities. And, you know, for him, he was like, uh, well, we can downplay the, the the culture piece and just, you know, if they're a good developer, we should have them, right? And he was like out there by himself, everybody else was not on that same page. And like yeah. for him, that was logic, right? Like, you know, you only work with good people. You don't hire just anybody. Everybody has to have the right skill set. That's, that's all you get, right? Um, but over time, he started working in teams that weren't as high performing as he wanted. They didn't meet the expectations that he had for the product or the project. And he started to shift back to that, like, oh, what is, what's the issue? It's like, yeah, I have, you know, talented peers, but we don't jive. We're not gelling. We're not aligned. We're not sort of moving the needle the way it needs to be moved. And, and now he's like one of the biggest culture advocates, you know, he's, you know, developing our culture products, he's doing everything that he can to push the software vision forward, right. But I think sometimes, as you said, that low point or those, you know, roadblocks and brick walls really help those logic leading folks to, to sort of see the difference and understand like, A and B, there is a difference, but sometimes you have to fill it. Um, before you can actually do something about it. Right, and and that brings up an interesting other element um, is the fact that uh, uh, that that high performing teams oftentimes have a ba balanced perspectives. But when we have a balanced perspective, oftentimes managers hire people that they feel most comfortable with. Well, that's oftentimes leads to a homogenous team rather than a yeah. balanced team. But the yeah. thing the thing is, a balanced team there's a higher incidence of of tension points between people that means yeah. that in general the standard or of uh, of collaboration of emotional intelligence ability to collaborate around these various situations needs to be at, at a higher level so that being said, um, it's no longer looking at people based upon only technical skills. I was guilty of that myself. I know what that, <laughs> that can lead to. Uh, yeah. But to also look at where they, where, where they are in their collaboration skills. And also, not only that, sometimes when, when there is an opening for a position, you could take a step back and look at your team. Is there a certain type of perspective that we, that we could use and actually look for that person um, um, for that next hire. So I think uh, I think that helps um, logically explain what it means for culture fit. Because a lot of people say, don't just hire for technical skills, hire for culture fit. But what does that mean? Sometimes, oftentimes it just means I felt good with the person. But if you actually <laughs> look at it, you know, from the balanced yeah. perspective standpoint, also from the collaborations um, standpoint, because the thing is nowadays companies, um, the ones that actually uh, thrive on that are the ones that are doing the best, um, simply because they they can capture value in between um, various components. And because yeah. a lot of traditional companies they 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 struggle with that, oftentimes because everything was made in an isolated silo in order yeah. for in order for everyone to stay in their lanes. Um, but then the thing <laughs> is, it the today's market 
evolved so rapidly these days that it's it's it, you won't be able to adapt in today's marketplace like that. You, 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 yeah. There needs yeah. to be another standard. Yeah, and I know for us, we had a little bit of a language change from culture fit to culture add because mm-hmm. you know sometimes when you say fit, people think they have to strip themselves of those differences to fit in. And sometimes hiring managers are looking for just that, as you said, that homogenous player. Um, but when you say culture add, you start to sort of reprogram your brain to think I'm looking for somebody that can add, which means that they should bring difference, a different perspective. They should bring different skill sets. They should be able to collaborate highly across those skill sets and differences, right? Um, and so I think that that's something where as hiring managers, culture leaders, DNI professionals are starting to influence um, sort of practices around the business. Those are certain terms that, you know, we've been sort of really talking about within software because it is critical. You know, if you're listening, that language can sometimes be what sets mindsets, you know, when it comes to critical decisions, when it comes to hiring, when it comes to even letting people go. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are some of the things that we've, we've come across. Right, right, right. And especially when when that additional perspective comes in, sometimes there's a boost and an increase in all of these capabilities within the team. Yeah. The thing I think to watch out for is whether like, um, so sometimes excessively hierarchical is uh, is one thing to watch out for. That's that's mm-hmm. that one's really difficult to integrate when a company yeah. is trying to make culture as like mm-hmm. a, a core strategy. Um, but I, I I agree by bringing yeah. in perspectives and uh, making uh, and looking at those various culture fit components. I think there's actually a lot of opportunities for the business. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask a a question. So yeah. Is the premise of your book by saying, you know, culture for a left brain leader, does it imply that a right brain leader has got it down uh, in terms of culture or like what, what was the angle of that title and why go down the left brain leader and not the right brain leader or both? Well, I, <laughs> that's a that's a great question. Well, first of all, I think the 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 needs or the journey that a left brain leader walks to understand this um, topic is a different journey, number one. So not all right brain leaders are, are skilled at this. There's a lot of right brain leaders that are not skilled at this. Um, but then oftentimes what I've seen is that they walk a different journey to make those realizations. Mm-hmm. So that being said, um, it was not the initial um, uh, title of the book when I was first walk when I first um, um, sat down to write it. It was called Culture Architecture. Mm-hmm. In order, what are the what are the what, how do you architect this together? Along the way, I've come to realize that that title didn't necessarily <laughs> resonate with uh, you know people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> To, but then more people could resonate with with left brain. Oh, I'm a left brainer. Oh, okay. Then may, maybe this it might have um there might be something for me. But really, the book is um, was actually designed to architect uh, a business uh, uh, where where uh, where culture could be used as a business strategy. Got it. The way you're describing everything, I'm I'm sitting there and I'm questioning: Am I right brain or left brain right <laughs> now? Am I am I considered a right brain leader or left brain leader? Because everything you're saying, I'm resonating with it, and I'm like, does yeah. that mean I'm a left brain leader? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Chris, do you guys have an opinion? I'm just trying to figure you, out. <laughs> you, you lean more left than right for sure. Really? Okay. Cool. Because I was resonating with everything Andrew was saying. That, that makes complete sense. Logical sense. Like, it all comes together. <laughs> and there are folks, um, just like there are uh, ambiverts for extroverts and introverts, there are those who exhibit both uh, characteristics. But there are some who weigh very heavily left. Um, Got it. Uh, because I, 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 I agree, I, I, I sense the left brain, but I also sense right brain from you as well, too. Mm. Well, but, but yes, I agree. The, the, um, the, the, the logical aspect, um, uh, if it's resonating, then definitely there as well, too. It makes sense because I definitely, I, I went to school to get a computer science major and a math minor, so I must be left brain, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right, right. I come from a science and science background as well too. So um, naturally, that direction of just understanding the world. Um, that's just the way my brain worked. In fact, in my training, it was all about how do you filter out the emotional bias um, that people throw at you and stay true to the logic. I mean, that was my training. Mm. <laughs> yes. And there are others with such training that are that exists in the business world. Got it. Do you have any? So what? In, oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry, no, was, mine might be quick because I'm just I was curious if you have any interesting kind of like stats or metrics on like this. I know it's not a track thing, but like, you know, industries or standards around leadership, like, is there a trend where like the higher up you go in certain industries, you're, you're finding more left brained leaders or is, is leadership impacted? Like, are there any trends within the space that you've seen in, in, in working with leaders? Well, I, I think there is an industry um, aspect for that. For example, uh, industries that involves like uh, science or, or a coding or accounting tends to um, um, those in that tends to have those types of individuals. I've also seen that, um, especially in traditional uh, companies, um, a lot of uh, traditional companies, senior leaders tend to be left brain or um, more uh, very data centric. However, I think there is a trend going on in that there's a greater awareness and realization that the, the aspect of promoting that culture culture and developing other people and teams is a, is such an important um, uh, core competencies that there is a trend going the other um, direction in which case are um, there is they're starting to uh, uh, bring up those um, who are strong in the right brain uh, more and more so but not only that I think I think I think on um, those who rise are a good balance because I think if uh, if a leader is only right brain, it's very difficult for them to understand data and the financial statements and and whatnot, and v vice versa the other way. They only look at numbers, and sometimes they can just uh, they can plow through people and also uh, also create uh, issues in some other ways. So that being said, um, uh, I I think those are some of the trends that I've seen industries um, also in terms of like how it used to be, how it's kind of going towards. Got, Got it. it. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, you know, this step-by-step -step process that you described, uh, the, you know, the four steps that you said, the evaluation speak to the heart, uh, the low point, and then I think you said the uh, third party inter intervention. Yeah, so it was the fifth one too. I just yeah. can't ring a bell right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. It, would it still be applicable to a right brain leader too? Oh, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, that that's like just a human psychology thing where people become open to ideas. I think the, the, the second one that I mentioned, speaking to, to what's like their language, that language is going to sound completely different. Like, for instance, someone trying to get buy-in from a group of coders versus someone who's trying to get buy-in from, uh, from a lot of salesmen, the language is going to look completely different. And if Got you it. use a similar type of language, we're just going to completely miss the boat. <laughs> Got it. No, no, no. That makes uh, that makes sense. So if, if if you look at that, speak speak to the heart. It's almost like the um, building an empathic connection with your audiences and communicating to them at that level, so they are able to understand you mm -hmm. and 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 comprehend and stuff. So that's very cool. Um, so really, although the book is titled Culture for the Left Brain Leader, this is really applicable to any leader. I think, I think it is applicable. Now, if someone is looking for a quick read to um, get inspired and whatnot, um, it's probably going to miss the boat on that one. Um, but uh, but um, uh, you don't necessarily need to be a left brainer to uh, to to get a lot of value from it because um, sometimes just by understanding um, uh, various things a bit better, uh, it could, even right brainers can actually get a, some value add. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, now talk to me if the book, uh, does it help with uh, a readership who are in leadership positions or would it be also beneficial for non-leaders to read? Well, the book does actually talk a, a lot of it from the leadership standpoint. So, mm -hmm. Um, I, tr I tried to um, 
get the book written in a way where it's like a reference along their journey of leadership. So mm-hmm. one thing I've seen is um, when someone reads it, something it does it doesn't quite resonate with them yet but then after they go through a critical experience in their life and then look at another part of the book again they get it then Mm -hmm. so that being said um i i think the book is written um from the perspective of the leader now if if let's just say you're a team member um, some of the concepts might seem a bit foreign. Now, I, I, I wouldn't discourage them from looking at it. I, I might encourage them to look, um, read it with a different lens by, mm. um, by just knowing these concepts exist out there. And let's just say they get they um, start having to, um, their supervisor now or ma- a manager or their leader for multiple teams. Now their world just completely changes the way that they have to do everything completely changes. And in which case in various um, steps along their journey, they can actually um, take in additional um, uh, like major learning points from it. Got it. Mm-hmm. So I know, I know we, we both agree on this term that, you know, culture starts with the leaders and leadership sets the tone. Um, but how do you think a leader can scale culture inside of an organization? What's your thought process there and philosophy around that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, in terms of a- actually, that's that's why um, that that topic was actually what initiated me f- to um, um, kind of dissect it the way the way um, I wanted to. Because the thing is, uh, it all begins with leadership. I, I 100% agree with that. However, once once an organization starts scaling with additional vertical and horizontal layers, now it's very difficult because you, um, the leader is not doesn't have direct access to everybody. And so meaning that uh, their influence is starting to get diluted simply because of the fact that they, they don't have access to everybody. So that's when we have to become dependent on various communication structures, rituals, various ways um, that they approach um, aspects, how they design some of their cross-functional um, processes, how they design their um, strategies in a way and at which uh, uh, cadence and intervals. Those things starts becoming more and more important and within the book, um, I, I do talk a lot about that. And so that, that means that um, by having those things, again, without, without that leader um, who, who, who believes in it, it's still not going to work. What I'm saying is that by, with a leader who wants to actually uh, 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 spread that across their organization, by having those things, it becomes like a, like a loudspeaker throughout the organization. Because with, when we don't, what, what I've seen are leaders who, are, who, who believe in it, but it's not penetrating the very various layers of the organization by in, by put, putting certain things in place. Now there's a channel for it to go through is what I've seen. Got it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And to say, for example, like I'm a leader of uh, uh, an organization and I believe in culture and the philosophy, but my team or my middle management are resistors. How do we overcome those type of situations in your in your philosophy and approach like how would we overcome middle management problems um, Mm -hmm. as as a leader of your company for the culture sake Mm -hmm. well um so we're talking about a direction of buy-in from a top-down direction it sounds like i've seen there are different forms of directions um so basically the middle manager is a critical person in all of this the reason why is because they have direct access to their team members and oftentimes on the an employee their um their biggest influence on their experience on the company is the middle manager now that being said um again uh by having by having um, the various uh, and the comm structures in place, by utilizing the various aspects in terms of uh, um, uh, the various aspects of when their mind becomes open, but not only that, um, there's also a pattern, a sequence in which case um, buy-in occurs as well too. By understanding that, for instance. Uh, it's unrealistic to get buy-in from everybody right off the bat. 
And it's important to reconcile that simply because uh, that way you can identify who the early adopters are, who the majority are, and who the resistors are. By partnering with the early adopters earlier on, then we can we can actually have um, a different efforts that penetrates the organization. And meanwhile, we're getting more buy-in from the majority. Where, whereas the resistors, well, we, we have to manage them in a particular way, con, uh, education, uh, trying to get buy-in. Um, and besides that, some resistors actually have a very valid concern that they're not resisting just um, to be difficult, but they actually see real obstacles. And sometimes you can make them into early adopters by, by t talking with them, actually recognizing that, that they're calling something out um, that, that would be a huge obstacle to the effort so that you can make them an early adopter. Now, there are situations, there are resistors where it, it, it's, uh, I think uh, Chris mentioned it earlier in, our co in the conversation where it's, it, it's, it's just not gelling, right? Well, sometimes a difficult decision does need to be made, unfortunately. However, in my opinion, that should be the last resort. We, I, I believe that we should, I believe that um, buy-in uh, should come first. And I think there are a lot of various tools and efforts that can be had for it. But, uh, but then at the same time, I want to be realistic as a left brain myself. Uh, I want to always acknowledge the fact that, you know, not everything is 100%. There are some times that that, that situation makes sense can, can i ask um i guess one of our one of the tenets of our love as a business strategy kind of philosophy and belief revolves around the aspect of self-awareness and introspection for leaders especially mm -hmm. i'm curious because that's where we always lead so if we're talking to a leader if we're consulting with a leader we're always first trying to get them to realize the role that they play in some of the blind spots that many leaders might have. Even if you think you're great, even if you are great, there's still blind spots of self-awareness and where your behaviors contribute and things like that. Um, does your book tackle any of that spectrum? Because like, it feels like if you just say, here's the process, but the leader himself is still kind of a jerk. I don't know, you know, any of those things. <laughs> You, I don't, I don't know how far that's going to go, right? I don't know. Like you can create all these systems of communication and stuff like that, but the, you know, whatever emails or comms that come through are going to be, they're going to fall flat or be fake or, or any of those things. Like, what about what about leaders who have actual, you know, people who you know don't enjoy working with them for one reason or another, or or aren't leading in a very you know compassionate, culture friendly way? What does your book address that, or what are your thoughts? Well. Um... I think that's a very, uh, very, very uh, great question. And that actually bring, um, has me bring up one other um, element of which is, um, which is identification of the hypos within an organization. It, it's a succession planning um, a concept and introspection is a very important element for that. Because sometimes an organization is in that situation because their definition of who who are great, who has the potential to be great manager, managers and leaders was not really standard, standardized. And so that being said, that's when, um, um, uh, from your words, uh, those without the introspection were inputted in, into certain roles that uh, were perhaps, perhaps they're becoming a blocker to the, for the permeation of the culture. So meaning that um, by having having that filter earlier on definitely helps. Um, but what but we're talking about a situation when we're already in there, right? So well, we're yeah, you know, th there's this element of just like a left brain person is commonly, you know, I feel like it's interesting, because I feel like a lot of what we create mm -hmm. is also for the left brain leader. Yeah, <laughs> but but trying to get them to say, hey, process and tools are great but you got to start somewhere else, like completely. And so that's, that's just kind of where, where I'm coming from is I, I think all of our ideas are still on the same side of the fight, but I think where we start and where we angle, the angle we take is a little bit different. And that's where I'm just like, I, to me, the person holding the book might be the problem. And I think, I think I'm wondering if your book kind of takes any time to like hold the mirror up to them on that. 
I agree. I agree with that. I think there's two um, two aspects to answer that question. One of the one of the steps, uh, one of the phases that I've actually noticed a pattern of it is the um, is the third phase, uh, culture um, initiation, and that requires a huge lean in component. That's what I like to call it: a lean in, a, a, a time to be vulnerable, open, and sometimes admit hey we weren't really there we were we weren't really doing what we needed to do as a managing leader in fact when i've helped people along the journey uh, phase one is a pre-culture phase by the way phase two is culture awareness um, and just getting the moving pieces together phase three is starting to do it and it's actually very common once you kind of get the um the various things together in phase two and and to um begin the process they hesitate and they hesitate because their instincts tell them this is going to feel awkward. This is going to feel very vulnerable. And I think it's because we had the systems line up to that part, um, moment where they have to be introspective to themselves and not only introspective to, to themselves, you know, what the outcome of the organization is and what they, what they would need to do in order to get the buy-in. So it's very interesting that you mentioned that because that sounds like the whole, the core crux of what the phase three kind of looks like. That's why in phase three, that's a time to just be with the people. Just, just be with the people, okay? Because uh, phase four is when a lot of other things starts getting introduced again, when we're starting to get buy-in and partnerships again. But phase three, you just be with the people. You, got, you have to make it about the people again. So I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, in fact, that, that, <laughs> that is where people get paralyzed for a second. Oh, I think I'm starting to understand what's involved. Besides that, um, besides the you know, recommendations in terms of um, in terms of um, hypothesis, also there, there's a chapter just that talks about the heart of a manager and leader, and I believe that the heart of a manager and leader, um, the coaching needs to be within their DNA, and and the reason why is because I think it's a good balance between results and people. If we're only focused on the results, then we can overlook the people. But then if we only look at the people, then we can also we can get walked on, right? And and not not um, keep the business sustainable. I find a coach coaching mentality is the good balance because the thing is your input are is less polished people. Um, and your output is uh, uh, well-developed well -developed people who collaborate towards a common goal. So it's a different input and output, and it does take um, it does take um, uh, rec it does take from their heart them to recognize that a different approach is necessary. I love that. I like mm -hmm. that. Like I agree completely with the coach's mentality thing. It's really interesting seeing all the the crossover of the same types of concepts and learnings, but you're using terms like input and output to describe this. <laughs> it's, pretty, <laughs> it's pretty great. I like it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, again, that's probably like a, a you know a left brainer thing, just seeing the world in that aspect. But I think actually it, it sounds like we're all, we're looking at the same elephant, but from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's what it looks like. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Chris, I, I, I looked at your face, didn't know that meant you had a question. I saw I paused. Did you have anything? Oh no, I don't have a I don't have another question. It's the down downside of the video side of this as well. We can see yeah. each other and then we misread cues. Yeah. yeah. Apologies to right. the listener for that awkward. <laughs> 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 so, you know, as as we as we run into the end of this conversation, I guess I have a lot of uh you know the 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 four of us frank's not here but the four authors of, of love as a business strategy we just kind of went through this journey so there's a lot of empathy right now for what you're likely going through um in this so anything you know is there like a what's your biggest kind of kind of takeaway or story kind of anecdote from this journey itself like as as trying to you know publish this book and get this word out there are you talking about in terms of the journey of writing the book or are you talking about just one a big story from from having experienced it um, going through the experience of, of e either 
either would work to be honest i'm, okay. I'm looking for yeah just where where's your where's that that story sit sure. for you well i think um this is the book that i wish i read before i did something like this and the reason why it was um even though i was guided along the way i wasn't i wasn't given the heads up of how challenging it could be <laughs> Now, the fact that there there could be early adopters, majority, and resistors, the fact that you manage them differently, the the fact how, how you can do that, because some of those tactical components, uh, I think, um, uh, could have helped. And I think it could help some other individuals as well, too. Especially some folks, um, the better they understand something with crystal clarity before they go in, I think that the more confident they can in, in, in pushing it through and getting other people's buy-in. So just understanding the components of, of the journey, what to expect, both the good and the bad, um, just to be like a pragmatist. It, this book was written from a pragmatist standpoint. I think it can, I think it can help. It, again, it's the book that I wish that I read before I embarked on something like this. And the book can be um, helpful in very many ways. In fact, w one thing I found is that uh, it's like one of the biggest reasons that someone wants, wants to go through something like this, not because they're interested in culture, they're interested in enabling innovation across the organization. Guess what? That requires culture. Right. <laughs> Trying yeah, to get yeah. people to be strategic um, at multiple layers, that too also requires culture. You can't force that in there and sometimes when what it's 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 not an atypical thing that they want to focus on the strategy component that they got the culture part down and then one's kind of going in that way no 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 we actually have to go <laughs> focus yeah. on on the culture fundamentals again so yeah couldn't agree more on that point for mm -hmm. sure yeah. Yeah, so if someone is interested, um, we uh, in the book, um, you know, they can learn more about it from cultureleftbrainleader.com. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if anyone wants to uh, um, pick my brain on the topic, uh, they can email me at andrew at cultureandstrategy.com. It's a topic that, um, that really ch changed my life, and I enjoy um, guiding others through that, uh, through that journey of multiple paradigm shifts. There's so many onions to peel along that uh, along that journey mm -hmm. so um yeah i'd be happy to uh to answer questions from there absolutely culture left brain and what what when does your book drop um the, uh, the the projected launch date is june 22nd of this year awesome awesome mm -hmm. well andrew super excited for that book i can't wait to read it and you know Good luck. And I know this phase that that we're in, right? Like the date wise, you're going through some of the more stressful parts of getting it to the finish line. So definitely good luck um, to you on that. And really appreciate you joining us today uh, and, and sharing about it. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Um, it, it, it was a fun conversation. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I, I'll just leave you this. I'll leave you with this. The day that it goes live, enjoy that day. Just cherish it that's a pretty big accomplishment so congratulations to you in advance but uh we'll be there looking out for the launch date so we can get our copies thank you okay, okay. wonderful thanks awesome yep and here on the podcast we'll be posting new episodes every tuesday as usual so if there's any topics you like if you enjoyed this conversation if you have feedback for us we'd love to hear it software.com slash labs l-a-a-b-s as you know we also have a book out now which is um, love as a business strategy and you can find that at love as a business strategy.com and at book retailers including amazon so if you like the podcast the book please check it out leave us a review and share with your friends and with that thank you muhammad thank you chris and especially thank you andrew for today's conversation and we'll see you next week please check it out leave us a review